You're watching Fugitive Red Eye, and welcome to another episode of Media Opinions. In today's episode, I'm, I'm going to be talking about a few things, primarily different types of protagonists, antagonists, and other characters in storytelling in regards to morality, idealism, realism, sympathy, things like that. There's a couple of different schools of thought on how a protagonist and an antagonist should be written, right? For instance, obviously I do like idealized characters, right? Heroes that are something to be aspired to. I think that that does absolutely serve its purpose, and I think we actually need more of that because in today's day and age we're too focused on everything being gray areas and having no real villains and stuff like that, and I think that that does go a bridge too far a lot, and, I, and there is a place for it. I absolutely think there is. In fact, I think we need both to an extent because I think part of the problem another way the other, the, on the opposite side, is if you make a character that's too perfect, that can do no wrong, that has no uh, humanizing aspects of them, because it's our flaws that humanize us, right? Like, our flaws make us human, and I think that having a flawed protagonist works really well. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the times in art, it can be written to have it so that you sympathize with everyone to a degree, or it can be written so there's very clear good guys and bad guys. And again, I think there's a place for both of them. I think they're both very important to art. I know Ayn Rand, Steve Ditko, objectivists typically like to have the idealized version where there's the very clear black and white, this is the hero, this is the villain, this is good, this is bad. And I do love that. You know, there's things like The Shadow, Mr. A, The Question, stuff like that. I do really like that style of storytelling. You know, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, these things are good. But at the same time, they're not subtle, and in a way, they're done more for the ideology than rather just being a story that makes you think. They can make you think. I mean, I do like objectivist literature. I think it's really good. I do have some objectivist values. I'm not a full-on objectivist, but in some ways I am, like I said. Which is funny, because the concept of that almost goes against the principle of objectivism, about not compromising and stuff like that, but that's beside the point. Uh, so I will be giving some examples today, right? Because I think that, you know, The Fountainhead is an excellent example of uh, the idealized protagonist and antagonist done right, right? Howard Rourke is very clearly the good guy. He's on top. He's this wunderkind. He's young. He's, he's, he's on top of things. He has his shit all together at such a young age. And, you know, all of the villains are very villainous. They're, they're like, they gotta keep him down and stuff like that. And that, that is very good at teaching the moral of the story. Uh, and uh, you get that in Atlas Shrugged as well. You know, obviously that is the point with objectivist writing. And it's, it's not to say that there isn't a way to write an objectivist character that is flawed, because look at early Spider-Man. Steve Ditko's input on Spider-Man, he did start out flawed, but that's because he was young. Uh, Ditko intended to make him into this objectivist hero by starting out young and then learning more as he went on. Obviously, once Ditko and Lee parted ways, Spider-Man went in a different direction. Spider-Man's still good after that in aspects, like Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man. There's different eras of Spider-Man with varying degrees of quality, uh, but I do tend to prefer that Ditko version. Something that I think is interesting that you could think of in a way, having flawed protagonists and even antagonists that are sympathetic can actually be a way to be idealistic in a different way, showing that no one is beyond redemption or that everyone is human. Uh, something that I really love about the show Succession, which I've been watching lately, is uh, I got five episodes left, by the way, so I haven't quite finished it, but I'm close. But something that I really like about it is Succession is a show about these rich, self-centered assholes who all do pretty terrible things, but it never dehumanizes them. They're always portrayed in a sympathetic light. And I love that because a lesser show would just make them the clear bad guys, right? Like, it would just make them out to be these evil, villainous, you know, sociopaths. And uh, I will do a full review of Succession when I see when I finish it. Uh, but another thing is uh, Shiv Roy, the the only female child of the Roy family in Succession, is also portrayed just as evil and unlikable as the others, which I think is great because a lesser show would be like, oh, okay, let's make the girl one the good one. Let's have the one good one. There is no one good one per se. Actually, you know what? I'd argue Connor is probably the one good one, and even then, he's also deeply flawed and insecure. But I would argue he's the most mature of the Roy children. Uh, but I think that also comes with the fact that he's also the most distant from the family. Which in and of itself is also really sad, because, you know, family, I think, is very important. I think family is one of the most important things. And that's another theme of the show, is the way that their family is, is very, like, broken and fucked up and sad. And that's that's one thing I love about it. And I think that that really works in humanizing them and making them sympathetic characters. Again, we'll go into more depth on Succession uh, when I actually do my review of it. 
Uh, but another example of a deeply, deeply flawed protagonist that you sympathize with, Alex DeLarge from Clockwork Orange, right? He's pretty fucked up. Uh, but part of the part of the fact is he's young, right? He's just a teenager, and he does a lot of horrible things. Uh, but then he goes through hell, and that makes us sympathize with him, and it humanizes him a bit, because we're seeing it all from his perspective. We also sympathize with characters like Walter White and Saul Goodman. And uh, in the case of Saul Goodman, for instance, Chuck McGill, and mild spoilers here, uh, is the good, morally upright one. But, you know, in season three, for instance, they make us dislike Chuck McGill quite a bit because he's morally upstanding. But it also comes down to, I think, the fact that Chuck McGill is disloyal to his brother and can't view him as a person. Uh, and also, Chuck McGill is an ungrateful piece of shit. Jimmy does so fucking much for him, and Chuck is such an ungrateful asshole about it. Uh, for instance, again, spoiler, 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 but there's that line where Chuck says to Jimmy, in all honesty, you've never mattered all that much to me. That's fucking heartbreaking, right? That 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 moment you realize, no, fuck this guy. Uh, another really good example is Tony Montana. Look at Tony Montana. He starts out as this really rough, a Machiavellian fucking drug kingpin rising to the top, right? Uh, but then it gets to a point where they have to kill innocent children, kill a mother and her children, and Tony's like, no. I, I, nobody said nothing about no kids, I'm not doing that. And then he, he completely turns on the people who were working with him on moral grounds and goes out. Like, uh, Tony Montana would could have possibly succeeded uh, rather than turning all of the other criminal organizations against him and having to go down in a blaze of glory. But he did the right thing. And that's another thing, is uh, in a story, does a character have to win? Uh, this is something that I've argued with some people online before about. I think a story where the good guys lose can be just as effective as a story where the good guys win. For instance, look at Bardock the father of Goku. There's no real clear-cut good guy other than Bardock is less evil than Frieza just by comparison. But Bardock is a genocidal evil fucking tyrant who's helping an even more genocidal evil tyrant. But Bardock cares about his people and his family, and so he goes out knowing that he has no chance of winning and confronts Frieza in a battle he knows he has absolutely no shred of even coming close to winning. I think a story where a character does the right thing, even if the consequences are death and there's no chance of success, can be inspiring. It's like, do the right thing just for doing the right thing. I mean, that also goes with, like, Rorschach, for instance. That's the whole point of Rorschach. I know Alan Moore wrote it in a negative light to try and make you think that Rorschach was foolish. But there's a reason Rorschach's the most popular character because, again, Alan Moore unintentionally created a masterpiece in spite of himself, uh, built on the foundation that Ditko and others put out there. I am a big fan of tragedy, as I've mentioned before, because I think tragedy can be effective and it's also more realistic and more true to life. Now that said, do I think every story should be a massive downer? Absolutely not. I think stories where the good guys win and show him prevailing against evil is good as well. But I think we need both. That's the point I'm trying to make here, is we need both the idealized story and also we need the cynical story. We also need the realistic story. We need the tragedy and we need the victory. We need both to make good art. You can't just have, you know, one or the other. I think both are good. Like. I mean, obviously, individual pieces can have one or the other. What I'm saying is, though, art as a medium needs it, right? We need stories that have both because you need to be able to think about these perspectives and think about the morality of the choices that you would make in the situations, the morality of the choices behind the characters. I mean, also, we do need bad art, too. I mean, that is true. Uh, you know, you need something to compare to what's actually good. Uh, as much as I don't like bad art, it does need to exist. Uh, but another example, I would say, is we also need, uh, we also need both sympathetic villains and evil villains, right? I think that there is a good place for both types of villains. Villains that are just ridiculously over-the-top evil have their place, especially in very black-and-white stories that are helping you learn morals. But, if you want something that's going to make you think and question things, you, you also should have villains that are sympathetic and make you feel for them. And in some cases, even make you feel like they're almost justified. I think that that also adds, adds to it and makes interesting, thought-provoking material. But again, I do think there is a bit of an obsession with that in today's day and age, to the point where that has become a bit oversaturated. We do need some more of the of the uh, objectivist look at it. Uh, but that said, a show like Succession, like I said, is super refreshing to see. A show that doesn't demonize these rich people, a show that actually keeps them human, even though they're fucked up. Again, I'll do a full review of that once I watch the last five episodes, but... 
you know, there's a lot of things that have been turning in my head making me think about this, being like, there's a there's a place for the protagonist that's likable, and there's even a place for the protagonist that's unlikable. For instance, look at Alex and Yik. I know a lot of people are fucking stupid about that and think that it's badly written because they don't understand it. When you actually understand the narrative of the character being an unreliable narrator, uh, it actually serves its purpose. If Alex was a likable person, it would be a very different game. If Alex actually changed from his mistakes, the game wouldn't be the same thing, right? Alex's inability to change and his need to twist the story and the narrative to make you think that he's better than he actually is, is part of what makes it brilliant. Like I said, I've completely accepted that Yik is actually good art and people who don't think that just don't get it. And I know that sounds pretentious as hell, but I don't care because, frankly, I like that it gatekeeps itself and keeps people from actually liking it. Uh, because I like niche fan bases. I don't like it when normies get too involved and it becomes, you know, oversaturated. Hell, I think there can be stories that ha have characters that are intentionally written to be unlikable, evil pieces of shit that fans ironically end up liking and actually, you know, rooting for. Like, for instance, Boogie. Boogie the Oily is very similar to Rorschach in what he was set out to represent, although he's much more extreme because Boogie, they made just like this fucking evil, sadistic piece of shit. Boogie's like the ultimate objectivist as far as, like, Boogie is an objectivist written by someone who hates objectivism. Like, that's the whole point behind the character. But he's a very good character, and uh, again, it's another one that gatekeeps itself, partially because, you know, it's kind of obscure, it's only released in Argentina, uh, it's never been translated into English. I'm talking about the comics, of course, the movie did come out here. Hell, when you look at Satan and Devil Man, he's written so well as a sympathetic villain, there's a bunch of the fan base that is retarded and thinks that he's uh, actually a good guy or the hero. When no, he's just a sympathetic villain with actual, like, reasonable motivations. Like, not reasonable action, but his motivations are understandable. Um, but that's all I really have to say today, I think. I think you get the point I'm trying to make. I think both forms of art, both idealistic and realistic, cynical, having a moral, is all important for art. Now, I don't necessarily think art has to have a moral, either. That's another thing. Art can just exist for the sake of making something that's an expression of something, right? Like, for instance, to make you laugh. Stuff like that, right? But again, we've kind of gone all over the place today, so I think you get my point. This has been Fugitive Red Eye. Have a good one. Toodles!